Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie Dorigny. I'm the Associate Director of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Welcome to the second talk in our SNF Rendezvous de l'Institut, the Fellows Series, where tonight you will hear Katarina Pistor talk about her current uh, book project, Coded Power. Katarina Pistor is the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia University, where she has taught for many years. The breadth of her work ranges from comparative law to corporate governance, political economy, property rights, and finance. She's been awarded more prizes than I can name tonight, and in keeping with the Institute's multidisciplinary calling, I must also mention that she's an accomplished harpsichord player. Um, while she's been a leading and innovative scholar in her field for many years, she rose to fame beyond the realm of law in 2019 with The Code of Capital, which I brought down. Maybe you want to put a plug for your own book. There you go. Um, how the law... Ah oui, en français, and what, what will it be called? Okay. <laughs> so in English, The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality, an international bestseller that demonstrates how capitalism depends on the law and how the law shapes the distribution of wealth. Crucially for me, the book is written with great care and clarity in plain English and is therefore accessible to people like me. I'm not a lawyer. Um, among the many raves, I'll read you what Thomas Piketty has to say, a fascinating book that demonstrates how the rights of capital have been entrenched in the international legal system. The Code of Capital opens the way for a thoughtful discussion about the treaties on capital flows and privileges that need to be rewritten, a must read. Her current project, Coded Power, takes us into the digital world where, as you will find out in a minute, more rules ought to be rewritten. The concept of coded power, Katarina suggests, and I quote, offers insights into how power is configured and reproduced in complex societies. Its influence results not from physical force, but from turning a widely accessible social resource, the legal or digital codes, into an instrument of control over others. It is indirect, subtle, yet purposeful and comprehensive in its reach. This is an intellectual and conceptual new frontier, something fundamental to think about. And if anyone can make sense of it and help us understand it, it's Katerina. Thank you. Does this work? Can you hear me? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marie, for this very kind <laughs> introduction. Uh, it's always a difficult act to follow. So this is a really a new project. It's at the level of a book proposal that my co-author, Kopier Georg, and I have been working on for quite some time. And I will try to work you through the logic of the argument as we have now developed it. Um, as many of you who are in the academic space will know, this very often when you come and present a theory, the theory is almost the end product of what you've been done so far. And now the real challenge is to see whether it's coherent and consistent, whether we can apply it to the stuff that we want to apply it to. Um, I also just put the name of my late sister Regina here because I wanted to use some of her um, artwork. She, she was an artist um, just to, to convey to you also visually um, the kind of things that I've been thinking about and her artwork sort of um, uh, I think also has influenced my own um, thinking. So let me just uh, start with how we have now um, defined coded power after talking about this. So Kopier has been teaching at Cape Town University in South Africa. I'm teaching at uh, Columbia University in New York, so we've been um, uh, ha having many Skype uh, meetings. Um, but where we came up out now after lots of conversations is that, that we un identify or define coded power as the control over the means by which social relations are constituted and reproduced. And, um, uh, and, and these are, of course, norms, symbols. It's also communication. And on top of that, the capacity to interpret and give meaning to these different symbols um, and different types of norms and communications. So that's, that's how I would like to think about coded power conceptually. 
Now, let me just go back to this picture. Some of you might have used PowerPoints and used this design help that you get from Google or whatever. And what they do is something like that. They give this representation. And I think this is already a transformative mode that reveals the coded power because it presents a new aesthetic that we simply are um, adopting or are buying into by using these kind of technolo technologies. And after I had produced this, or after the Google <laughs> helpers had produced this, I was thinking that I want to have a different rendition of how I think about coded power. And this is um, some of the work that my sister had done. She was very much intrigued by labyrinths and also the the, just the, the brain and the structure of the brain. So you see like a labyrinth that is much less symmetric and geometric than you would typically think, but that's how she thought about this. And at the same time, you get also a sort of a depiction of the brain, which already is a little bit emptied out, and that's, I think, the process that happens with our own brain and imagination if we buy into the kind of um, ways in which um, Google and other helpers on the internet um, help us think about the world. So. One of the um, important things that I think that happens in this transformative moment from um, you know, just using a concept and then thinking about how it can be represented, interpreted, and fed back to us, two things happen, and, and, and I think they were very well defined by James Spaniger in a book on control. He calls our, our current moment the age of control. And he says control really has two important elements um, uh, built into this. One is the increasing capacity to compute or um, um, information. So you increase the cap capabilities to process and compute information, and you can trace this over history saying, Buroc the, the bureaucracy that emerged not only at states, but also within firms has made it possible to control very complex production processes. In our age, of course, it's computerization and the computational power that computers and now co cloud computing <laughs> brings to us. But at the same time, and that's also critical, is we're also decreasing the Im amount of information that is fed into that because we are just ignoring a lot of information. So it becomes relatively abstract. And of course, the question is, what are the cues that are being used to, to, um, to feed back into, um, in, into the information that is um, coded and that is then used also to control others? So as we apply the concept of coded power, so of the idea of, of using the social resources that helps constitute societies to the, the data world that we live in, we are also um, read a lot into information theory and um, information uh, data is, is typically defined as information on a device. So data and information is almost the same thing, but it's data is really on a device, of course, on a device that can uh, use digital power. Um, and then we are basically saying in this context, coded power really has three important elements. One, one, is, one is the storage of information. The second is the communication, the control of communication. And the third is interpretation, and that's done through um, uh, computation. So storage is deciding what kind of information, the volume information that is, um, that is being stored, and who has access to this kind of information on what conditions. Communication is the kind of networks that you build, the scale and scope of the networks, but also the interoperability of the networks. So you can have open interoperable networks, or you can have closed gardens, and many of the social platforms are closed gardens and don't talk to each other. Our internet still does. So these are design choices that are being made, and I think that then inform how we can um, live in this increasingly digitized uh, world. Um, communi um, communication, the other things, of course, the pace of information, the direction of information, and the conditions under which something, for example, becomes viral is also part of the setup that others do that we don't even realize is being done to us, but that is, in, is then shaping the way that we interact with one another. And last but not least, of course, giving meaning to um, the symbols, norms, communication, information that we share. Um, that is in part um, driven also by, by others who, who, who lend in, um, interpretation to it. What is the meaning of it? Or can certain types of information be verified, yes or no? Could we build this into the system or not? These are all sort of subparts, but the, the three important elements are storage, um, uh, communication, and interpretation, so SCI, if you want. 
So when we think about coded power, of course, we have to think about the coded part of it and also about power. And um, uh, so I just went back to very basic power theories, one of them, Dahl, who basically said, uh, power is the ability to make someone do something he or she would not otherwise do. So you're being sort of nudged into making certain movements and making certain steps that you would other otherwise not do. And this can be done either by holding a gun to your head or by inducing you to do this in other means. Um, uh, there are lots of the power theories, and it's a literature that is almost impossible to master. So we're basically selecting the ones that speak to us for the world of data that we want to talk about. Um, so Giddens' uh, structuration has something to say, not maybe the final word, word to it, but I think it has something to say. So what he's saying is that uh, structuration is that, or is power is the trans transformative capacity of human action, and this is important, that will derive in the main from this ability of agents to harness structures to their projects, right? To harness existing structures that people are already using to the specific project. And the examples that he gave was, of course, language, um, uh, syntax and rules of grammar, but also status like citizenship and nationalism. And you could add, I would add, of course, the legal code <laughs> and, 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 and other such uh, uh, structures. Another concept of power that I find really intriguing is infrastructural power, especially if you redefine it and uh, adapt it a little bit for the purposes that we are talking about. Um, uh, Michael Mann in 1984 was trying to, uh, again, sort of define what state power is. So a lot of the power theories are really thinking more about the state, the nation state that has occupied us so much. I'm trying to use these power concepts and. Uh, independent of the state. Not that I'm saying the state of but I also want to see and understand and explain alternative and, and maybe competing power structures. But in the context of state power, Michael Mann was interested in the question, what makes the state relatively autonomous from society? So the state is not only then captured through patronage systems by society, but is relatively autonomous from society and yet can influence it. And how does the state accomplish that? And that gave him this idea of what he called infrastructural power, the capacity of the state to actually penetrate civil society, which he distinguished from despotic power, which would be using coercive powers against uh, people. Um, examples for him of this infrastructural power is literacy, again, language literacy, um, coinage weights and measures he listed as well, and transport and communication infrastructures. So different types of infrastructures, of course, that's already uh, built into um, the, the, the name. Now, more recently, several authors have used this idea of infrastructural power in different types of context. And Benjamin uh, Braun, for example, a sociologist uh, from Germany, he has written a paper where he looked at finance, private finance, employing infrastructural power. And the way this works, he argues, is that the more that states use market mechanisms to influence society, the more that central banks, for example, again, um, engage with financial markets by buying and selling assets in financial markets, the mo more private players in these financial markets can influence the state. Because they're basically on their own terrain now and can use their own mechanisms to gain access to state power. So he argues essentially that infrastructural power is really an infrastructural entanglement. It's a two-way lane. It's not a one-way lane. So it's, it's not just the state trying to influence civil society, but other people, other actors, non-state actors trying to influence the state through certain types of mechanisms. And then Pinzer has um, written an interesting um, a paper uh, based, I think, on a PhD project where he um, argues that um, infrastructural power is really an <coughs> the capacity to integrate relations and coordinated practices across technical, organizational, and social components. And the most important empirical example that he brings is the rise of commodity exchanges in the 19th century, which basically combined information about crops with information about price. They took advantage of the newly emerging telegraph systems to communicate information about crops and prices and bring this together in organizational form that gave them a, a comparative advantage over everybody else. And I think these are in, in, interesting illustrations, interesting examples to think about coded power also in the, in the context um, of data. 
Um, as you can see, this is again a piece of art by my uh, late, late sister, sort of what, what she was wrestling with is sort of the way in which I think we are all kind of controlled by other forces. And um, so this is one of the pictures where I think you can sort of see the infrastructure creeping, in, um, creeping into the social relations here. So when we think back to the concept of coded power, I again want to say that, um, of course, this is not, not an entirely new concept. Um, I'm quoting here Foucault, who of course has uh, talked about the capillary functioning of power, the sort of the, the way in which power relations infuse all of our um, social relations at the same time, as he put it, the multiplicity of force relations, the process which through ceaseless struggle and confrontations transforms strengths or even reverses um, uh, these force relations. What we are interested in is something a, lit a little bit more tangible. Um, so it's really the control over the capillaries themselves. And I would regard both the legal code but also the digital code as one of these tangible, relatively tangible manifestations where you can use um, uh, uh, control over these capillaries to influence and shape um, um, society. So for legal coding, as I tried to explain in, in, in my previous book, you're basically forging and repackaging social relations in something that is legally legible so that you can enforce it in a court of law, so that you have this additional commitment that if you do not do what you promised me to do, I can take you to court, I can enforce it. And that lends certain, a certain level of certainty, a certain level of predictability, never absolute certainty. You might not be able to enforce anything if the other party has nothing, but the threat of enforceability adds something to it and also changes the social relationship that we're ta um, talking about. And similarly, um, the coding of, of social relations cha changes and structures social relations in a certain way. Okay. Okay, so what we're now doing is we're basically using this concept that also requires more development, but I just wanted to give you the concept up front to see how we're employing it to explain the world of data. What we are confronting when we look at the emergence of our data society are a couple of puzzles that we're trying to explain. and We're trying to use our theory of, of coded power uh, to, to, to explain these puzzles. So one puzzle is that we have, um, uh, we've had a very strong development of a uh, battle for open source. And in fact, a battle for open source that has largely been won. I, sh I will show you this in a couple of um, uh, pictures uh, in a second. So we have prevented the complete enclosure of software by private actors. Uh, software is most of the relevant software is actually nowadays open source. So that's kind of interesting. If you think about the importance of software coding maybe as a way to control others, how come this did not happen? Another puzzle is the internet. The internet was developed, of course, as most of you will know, by the um, military in the United States, a hierarchical organizational form that was trying to find a response to manage and control increasingly complex processes of military management, but also of um, dealing with nu potentially nuclear attacks and making the defense system resilient against multiple tax attacks from different sides. Um, so that's also why already the, the mechanisms that they developed were not as hierarchical and centralized as you might imagine. The system as such is designed to be uh, packaging and separate um, um, uh, modes of decision making um, so that you can have some survive if there's an attack on, on, on one. But this creature of the American military was transferred to civil control in a way that structured a relatively multi-actor, multi-stakeholder, relatively decentralized structure. Not all is good and well with the internet. We know that sort of net neutrality is, is um, up for grabs, um, but it, for quite some time we've lived with a relatively effective, multi-stakeholder, interoperable, uh, relatively decentralized structure, and yet the origins was in a centralized structure. So we rescued, if you want, the internet from the claws of centralized control. The question is whether we can do this um, for much longer. And then the final puzzle is that we're dealing with something today, data, that has all the characteristics of things that should not be enclosed or enclosable, right? When we enclose land, when we enclose um, um, tangible assets, we think that we can actually you know, just build a fence around them. Data are, by definition, um, uh, ubiquitous. They're not scarce. That's one of the attributes of 
capital assets or uh, goods that, that have value and where you can uh, capture the value. So they're not scarce, they're ubiquitous. We're always producing them more and more and more. And even more importantly, um, data are non-rivalrous. So uh, it's not like you, I eat your piece of cake and then you can't have it, but we can all eat the same <laughs> cake and we will still have more cake. So the puzzle is that data has become one of the most valuable economic assets today, even though the very characteristic of data is non-rivalrous and also not scarce. Um, and, and, and so these are the kind of things that we want to explain, also understand how did we get here? How did we actually arrive at the point of enclosing data and yet not enclosing the, the software code and keeping the internet relatively decentralized? And what can we learn from these different processes about responding to and dealing with what we call uh, coded power? Oops. So here I just wanted to show you, you know, who won the battle over the source code. When you think about um, open software codes, Unix, um, Unix and Linux is uh, much more important today than Windows is. Um, in the mobile market for all the smartphones that we're carrying around uh, um, with us, Androids are all on open source um, software and, um, and even iOS, the Mac um, devices, the origins of that go back to the Berkeley uh, hacker community, which also at some point uh, was an open source. So on one hand, the battle for open source was won clearly in favor of open source. On the other hand, you see that a company like Microsoft has become enormously valuable over time, although it lost the battle over the code. And the, uh, the, the explanation is data. They, like most of the other big tech companies now, have enclosed data. They've given up on the code, right? the software code, but they now have enclosed um, data. So let me come back to the elements of code data power. I said it's storage, communication, and interpretation, right? And this again raises um, interesting questions and also just um, it's an interesting story to tell in terms of the sequence, the historical development of, of, um, of uh, uh, coded power. So just the element of storage. Many of you will remember the floppy disk that we had and other sort of hard disks. Um, um, I don't remember sort of the, the, the huge mainframe computers, but in the 50s and 60s, you started having these huge computers that only a big university or the military could have. But the interesting thing is anybody who had access to these big machines had access to all the data on these machines, right? So it was hard to get your hands on a computer, but once you were on the computer, there was no, no way of uh, controlling who would really have what kind of uh, data. They would just have all, all access to the data. The period where we as ordinary consumers had most control over our, our own data was the early period of the personal computer. When we saved everything on our hard disk and we had these little disks, floppy disks or the hard disks to transport it from one place to another. That's when we were data sovereigns. It didn't last very long. Now we're all on the cloud and the cloud of course is controlled by big tech companies that control the storage of in information and therefore I have access to our data and can use them in ways that we don't have control over. For this to happen, this also raises an interesting puzzle. How come they can capture all these data? Whose data are they? Who, who owns the data is the lawyer's question, right? And here's interesting, you know, you would think that the producers, you and I who produce this information should have control over it. It's our data, right? Um, under Roman law, you had, um, you can think about how do we allocate control rights over different stuff from two perspectives. One is to say you have either res communis, this is something that belongs to all of us and nobody can appropriate, nobody can take for herself. Rivers, beaches, the air, all this is res communis. And then there are res nullius. These are things that don't belong to anybody, but they can be captured. If you shoot the animal, it's yours. And effectively, the big data companies have used our data as if they were wild animals. Right? So the Roman conception is a nice starting point, but nobody sits down and has a political debate about whether should this be use communis, should this be, be res nullius, but somebody makes the move and starts appropriating data and unless we stop them, this becomes the new mode of doing things. And I think the big da um, data companies basically have treated our data as, as, as wild um, animals. Now, in the end, our data have been privatized, but this doesn't happen just so. There are first movers that do that, but they also realize that they need legal protection. 
So already back in 1986, you had the um, Computer Anti-Fraud Act enacted in the United States, which basically says whoever has captured data on a device, if somebody else comes and hacks into the device, that's effect effectively theft. And that's basically when you say if once the person who can store data on a device and has control over a device controls the data. That's the move that was already made in the mid-1980s. And that then, I think, gives you the, the legal explanation for how data companies could go out and harvest all our data. The more they could grab and put on a device, the, the more that they could control. On top of that, US courts have, have consistently argued that the individual data producers do not have ownership over their data with a very simple, arguably wrong argument, but one that American courts have applied for a long time, is you have property rights only over something that is of economic value to you. So show me that you can sell your own data for any reasonable price. Nobody, well, nobody can do this because the data are valuable only in aggregate. Right? So nobody has property rights in their own data because they have no economic value. So they, they have economic value only once they have been aggregated and cleaned and processed. And so therefore, um, the big tech companies have ownership over them. Once you say you don't have property rights, then you also can, cannot say and somebody injured you if they took your data. Because there's no injury, you don't have property rights. If you don't have property rights, no injury, you don't have standing in court. So very often when people try to litigate, they don't even get standing in a court of law. Right? The important thing here is to realize this is not something that is a, was a decision that was made ex ante, but it's the interplay of multiple decisions, the interplay of the capacity to grab data, um, and the interplay of, an, an, of a legal system that has always privileged those who can make economic value with something rather than anything else that might be equally or more valuable from a different perspective. <coughs> And certainly, societies have always been very bad as, at, at really protecting the use communis, the commons, against intruders. We have never really been effectively effective at doing that. Okay. The substitute for pro property rights is that something that we all, of course, experience now every day with um, the GDPR and the effect <coughs> of the GDPR on our activities on the internet, is that basically we have cre created a sort of a, a weaker little right, which is privacy. And privacy doesn't have such a long standing in, in legal discourse as property rights do. Um, it has sometimes constitutional protection, which, however, the scope of which is debated. Um, you know, the, the, the Roe v. Wade, the famous abortion decision in the United States was based on privacy. It was just overturned. So what privacy really means in constitutional context is something that is up for grabs. In the common law, privacy is also a relatively young concept. In law, usually what is older counts a little bit more. Um, but there can be statutory protection, and the European GDPR has created relatively effective statutory protection. I think the point that we want to make is that if we are right about the fact that this is really about power and control of entire societies, then thinking about individual privacy is insufficient. It, it's a little thing, it's better than nothing, but it's, it's, it's clearly insufficient. Let me come to the second building block. So we have storage, now I come to communication. So Communication is, of course, relational. So in that sense, all data are relational, which again also explains why privacy is really not the best way to think about this, because privacy is individual privacy. But whenever I reveal information about me, I'm also revealing information by others that are like me, or I might even be revealing information about family traits if I do genetic testing or um, you know try to find my ancestors or something. I also reveal information about my siblings um, uh, and, and others. So whatever we do in, um, in communicating is, of course, always re um, relational. Um, the power of information derives from the fact that whatever information contains, it's, it's never negative. It's either you have zero information in, in an event that you observe, or you have positive information. Um, and of course, information is not only about the individual that you are, or the, the, the event that you're observing, but it's also about um, inferences that you can make from that. Um, when the web, the World Wide Web was designed, and when people were thinking about systems of communication, there was a big debate how to structure um, these kind of relations. Um, and that started already with sort of the, the question of how to design a hypertext, how to design basically a, te a, a, a text online. 
What we have today is what computer scientists call one-way link linking. So most of the information on that is used and reused go, is unidirectional. You can't trace the origin of the information. Um, companies build cookies to get around of the internet. The originator of something that is being put out there is, is, is basically being lost. There was a big debate about this, and people had argued very forcefully for trying to do two-way linking, to allow people to trace things back and to link it in different ways to different types of information, hook up to this information, incorporate it into their own work, but also being able to trace it back. The fact that you can't trace it back also makes stealing easier, right? So it doesn't give you the, co the, the ownership right or copyright um, uh, feature. And especially if you have multiple people participating and putting something together that then can be used for productive or even artwork, um, uh, 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 it would be nice if you could uh, um, link, it, link it backwards. Um, and then the last um, feature of communication is sort of, again, the, the scope. I mentioned this before, we can design areas of communication that can be walled gardens. That's what many of the private platforms today are. They're not interoperable. You're either on Twitter or you are on Mastodon, but you are not on both at the same time. You can, of course, post parallel on the same time. So it's still interesting to just realize sometimes and think about that the, that the internet as such has been built to be interoperable, that you have multiple networks that can speak to one another. And we're increasingly losing this feature. OK, and then last but not least, we have interpretation and computation. And so we start again from the big mainframe computers and their capacity back in the 50s and 60s all the way to, uh, to, to the cloud today. This is just a short timeline. What we've tried to do here is just to put these things together. So we have storage, computation or interpretation in the middle, and communication. And then looked at what, what events were really critical in shaping the development of the digital code over time. I'm not going to walk you through all this. The only thing I really want to highlight is this. In the 2000s, in the last 20 years, we basically have the consolidation of control over all three aspects, over, over storage, over communication, and over interpretation. And that combination of all three aspects gives the big tech companies the power they exert um, uh, today. And, and, and sort of the manifestation of this is cloud computing and the big data farms that are controlled by uh, relatively few companies who then control access to the data. And the fact that they have already amassed so much data gives them a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis others. So stepping back um, again is to think how to think about this. I want to make again this point, this is not the Benthamian panopticon, right? So this is this idea that you could build a prison system where you have a central guard who can observe all the prisoners without the prisoners being able to look back or maybe even know that they're currently being observed. Or rather, they are knowing that they might be observed already uh, makes sure that they behave in a certain way. But this, this idea of Bentham that was never realized, there was no take up by states, it was designed for a centralized state actor to control prisoners, was never realized exactly like that. There are some prisons that try to mimic this. Um, uh, but, but the point is that the internet was not built by one big agent. It was not one centralized power that built it in this, fa in this fashion, but it emerged through as doing a process where people made different design moves on the digital level and at the same time exploited certain features of the legal system which prioritized um, the economic use of, of property rights, for example. Right? So Foucault famously, <laughs> he was very intrigued by this panopticon and he used it again metaphorically saying that the inmate is seen but does not see, he is the object of information, never a subject of communication. And that I think is a, it's sort of a powerful metaphor and m maybe we can depict ourselves sometimes in, 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 in the, this role today. But in fact, this panopticum, if it exists today, was not built by a single Leviathan. And I think what we have to understand are the processes through which it was built, because I think they might also give us a handle on how to rebuild um, the system in a different um, fashion. So there were alternative ideas out there. Uh, one of the famous cult figures um, of the early design of the internet was uh, Ted Nelson. Um, uh, he was certainly a utopist. Um, he was a visionary. 
he was a cult figure, lots of people followed him, he might also have been um, just a little crazy. Um, so there are divided views on that. But his argument was basically, um, it's not what machines do, but the ideas that we have about machines. I should say he was a sociologist. He was not a computer guy. He didn't know how to write code, but he hired a lot of coders and he had close relations with the hacker community to, to try to develop what he called what's um, Shanadu or Hanadu, sort of an idea of creating a very creative, interactive type of console that would bring, bring everything together. So in one quote that I put up here, he says, all I want to do is to put Renaissance humanism in a multi-dimension responsive console. It's a very different idea of how the internet could be used than what we do today. And he also had this idea of having multiple linkages, so not unidirectional, one-way linking of information on the web to the other, but you could link it back and everybody could link their own information to all kinds of other things and you could have this enormously creative web. Now, to be fair, or to be critical maybe of his ideas, he had a lot of computer um, folks, coders, who tried to realize his ideas. And after 20 years and more, and even investors who backed it at some point, it was not realized. So what one could say is either it's a crazy idea, it's, it's not feasible, or they didn't have the computational power at the time to do something like that, which of course requires much more computational power. Um, so what we believe is that actually the idea of having multiple linkages and a more creative internet is not a bad idea. And that the idea of linking whatever you do back to its source is not also not a completely alien idea. So we do this in academic research. We do footnotes, right? We read a lot of literature and we reference the origins of our, our thought as best as we, we can. And there's no reason that you could not also put this on the internet. In open source software, the software is being reused and recoded and referenced while we're doing this. So there's another application where the idea is such um, is at least um, uh, in, in the kernel is realized here. And, and in digital art, you also can see the, um, the rehashing of, of, of art that is already out there. There's now the new um, um, the fungible, fungible tokens that are being used to trace um, copyrights and ownership rights um, as well. Um, but it's, it's feasible, even though maybe at the time that they tried to realize it wasn't done. But what we're looking for are these inflection points. When were there ideas? When were there attempts to create a very different kind of a digital code that could have produced very different social results than we see today? And is there anything that we can harness from these inflection points? I'm not sure how much time I have. I just wanted to do a few more minutes. Yeah, OK. So how, how then can we explain what we observe today? Right. So observe, I think the. Um, uh, the end result is, has been described by many critics already. Um, um, Zoshana Zubov is, is one of them who calls the surveillance capitalism, but there are many other critics of the systems that we have. Um, one uh, figure or one scholar who has worked a lot on different type of technological change in history, Thomas Hughes, he basically has identified a pattern, but at a very high level of abstraction, at a very macro level, he says, with every technological change, you first get sort of this moment of disruption. So a new technology com becomes available and everybody's scrambling around at what to do with that. Um, so the first phase is unorganized, diffuse set of inventors do all kinds of things. The second phase is some system builders identify an opportunity and are trying to consolidate what is happening in this messy experimental phase on the ground into something bigger and larger, usually something that they also can control, very often driven by the profit motive. Then you have phase three where others are trying to compete with that. So you have competing system builders that are trying into the getting into the game. And at some point, but at some point whoever has won that game is trying to prevent others from more in innovation. So you get standardization and the limitations of, of new innovative capacity here. And you can see this, but I think it's, it's so intuitive that you see this almost everywhere, and I don't think it's sufficient to explain what we see. So of course, I want to bring in a, l a little bit more political economy, because I think the way in which we have crafted our institutions creates a very strong bias in favor of a capital mo capitalist mode of, of control. So capitalism is extractive. It is expansive. What is extracting is surplus 
it's very much future oriented, so I want to ideally realize future surplus even today by making financial assets tradable, for example. And we have created institutions, property rights, collateral, contract, uh, corporate law, trust law, bankruptcy law, these are the modules of the code of capital, as I call it in my previous book, to make that possible. So it's, 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 it's deeply um, a legal problem, not just a financial issue. Um, uh, and the idea is that we want to realize today the future, uh, future gains. Um, and the selection bias is, of course, in favor of those system builders who know best how to create pecuniary value or how to realize today future gains and capture them um, uh, for themselves. So unless I think we understand the context in which we develop the technological, um, uh, uh, the new technology co code, I think we don't understand the system as such. Okay, so that's basically our diagnosis. So what we're saying is we have to look at the evolution of the digital code. We also have to look at when decisions were made, sometimes inadvertently. You make a decision only because it's just a more elegant design, or it's just not technologically feasible right now to do something else. But this can bring us down a path that is very difficult to reverse and that can sort of enable the form of coded power that I was trying to describe. And of course, at the same time, we're seeing that either loopholes in existing legal institutions or the built-in biases in legal institutions or lobbying for, con for new legislation for Congress, like in the 1980s, with the, uh, with the new uh, Data Anti-Fraud Act gives you an opportunity to really establish control also in a legal manner. So what we try to do is just to um, think back and see, okay, what should be the principles of a digital code, right? If this is not what we like, what should be the principles of a digital code? So here are just four principles that we think should, be, um, should inform the future coding of our data. One is that individuals and collectives, not only individuals, but individuals and collectives, should be able to store data, store data, not only consent to their particular use, but even store data in ways that prevent others from accessing without consent. So we believe that this massive control over data storage is one of the power builders for the big tech companies that we have. Second, data stored in this way should be analyzable by a broad range of algorithms and ma methods. So what you want is that people can control where data is stored, but they can also give consent that others can use algorithms to analyze these data, maybe for public health purposes, maybe for other purposes. Ultimately, this has to be decided by the data producers, right? But it also should not be the case that somebody controls access to the data for fees, but we should be able to use these data as eff effectively res communis, right? You just need to establish the rules for this. Third, data analysis must not impede the individuals or groups of individuals' rights to the data, which basically says, I also can take it back. I want to take my data back. I don't want this to be used in this fashion anymore. So you have to have a way out again. And then fourth, individuals or groups of individuals need a way to jointly determine for themselves how they manage rights to the data. So we need collective governance structures. If it's not just about privacy, not only about our own, own property rights, but about social control, then we also have to build mechanisms for social control. And that's, that's of course, one of the big challenges of this project. Okay, this is the technological side um, of things, and I'm not gonna go into the details here because I wouldn't be able to explain in detail to you exactly <laughs> what these mechanisms are, but my co-author basically has identified sort of fr the frontier of technological development and said certain kind of things could be used to realize the principles that I just put before you. Others are less feasible, but there is a lot of activity going on in the frontier of data um, coding a lot of this might just go the way that other innovations have gone in the past. The big companies will buy them out, up and repurpose them for their own benefits or close them down. But in principle, there are technological, there are technologies available that could um, allow us to do things differently. And the good news is in a way that the future of data is still up for grabs. Right? We know that how, how it's been done um, until now. But unless we keep producing and storing and interpreting data in the same fashion, um, then we can also undermine the power base of the current uh, um, structure over our data. This I won't get into either, but this is a basically a, a sort of a concrete example for how you could make sure that individuals can make decisions about how their data will be stored, how they can make collective decisions about who might run algorithms on it, how they can also withdraw um, decisions, how you would do this in a digital fashion. But I won't bore you with this 
Uh, again, this is also something that uh, Copia would be more able to explain to you today. Okay, so in long story short, is um, there is a slight utopist, and I don't want to say that we believe that data or the technology will save us, it won't. But there's a potential here, because the new information technology, including cryptographic technologies, would allow us, in theory, to realize some of the principles that we have put out um, if we harness them in a certain way. So there's, in the technology that we have, there are mechanisms built into them that we could use for different type of design. How we make use of this, whether we make use of it, and who makes use of it is ultimately a question, of course, of political um, e e economy, but it's also not beyond our control. That's basically the idea. And in a way, the digital code could then also operate as a commitment device contra the very strong bias that we have in our legal coding um, to today. So rather than conforming to established institutional biases, it might also do something else. Okay, and the last slide I give you is sort of a more colorful brain. And if you want to look at more pictures of her, that's the website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina. That was so great. Um, I have a question about what your um, what stage you're at with the work on this research at the moment and what you're using your time here um, to do. Yeah, so this is the pro proposal I proposed for coming here as a fellow. Um, we are at the stage that we wrote a book proposal and we're currently shopping it around. Um, so we have a sample chapter and we have a lengthy book proposal and we have an outline for each of the chapters. Um, and we've done a lot of background homework, but we haven't written it, it yet. Yeah. There might be the follow-up question to for whom are we writing this book, right? It, which is a, an interesting question. So I think our uh, ideally would like to write the book for the coders, the digital coders, the nerds who are doing this stuff, um, in part to also educate them about sort of the power that they exert. Um, there are entire communities of coders that are very much aware of that, but I think our goal is to say, you know, there are technologies that you know and you can harness and you could use for different type of purposes and this is how and if you don't do this, this is what ha would happen. So that, that's kind of an ideal audience. And at the same time, we also want to reach an audience that is completely unfamiliar with the digital coding and give them some tools to understand how this thing has evolved over time from that perspective as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, that was um, fascinating. So I know nothing about any of this, so this is coming from a place of total ignorance. I guess I'm, j I'm just a little confused about how these, f these principles you enumerate at the end could be actually enacted. Would it be sufficient for coders to start coding in a different way, or would one need to have sort of international bodies in place that we're enforcing? Yeah. Um, why would the big tech companies, I mean, obviously they would try to stop this, so yeah. how, how would these changes come about? Yeah, it's a good question. So what I haven't put in here, and that's um, because it's also very much work in progress, is what is the governance side of things? Because you can say, well, technologically we could make these moves and we have the technology available to push on this frontier, but the technology alone won't save us, right? So I'm always the one in our relationship, and that's why I should have said a bit more here about this, that says we need governance as well, right? And, and how should that look like? And I think in line with these principles, what I'm currently sort of uh, looking into are basically the new literatures on, on um, uh, open democracy or what people call liquid democracy. So participatory decision-making by you and me not international bodies, they will be immediately captured by the powers that are. So I think we need different types of decision-making processes that are collaborative and, and participatory. Um, and not, and with, the po with the possibility, and that's what you know, people writing in the, in the genre of liquid democracy are talking about, how to delegate specific decisions to others without losing the right to recall that delegation. Um, and so you can find people who know more about certain types of issues to whom you want to delegate, whom you want to trust. Of course, there could be also views of that. You can have, we can imagine the marketing around this or the propaganda that's going to be made about this. But the, but the idea is you delegate certain type of decision, you can take it back. You delegate for a time, you can take it back. You don't delegate for four years and can't do anything for four years. No, it's got to be more participatory, more local. It's got to be easy. That's sort of the challenge to design something that is both 
technologically feasible and also socially feasible. If we all sit down every day, every week for half a day to make our decision who makes what kind of other decisions, it's not going to happen, right? So it has to be relatively standardized and it has to be made in a way that people make certain types of commitments that are durable for some period of time, um, that they will make their data available for certain purposes. And uh, etc. But th this is this is then event eventually again sort of a, a question of how to design a, uh, a governance solution in a technologically feasible fashion so people would actually use it. But the two belong together again. That's a very good question. It's exactly the thing I missed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have um, a little bit of the same question as you, but I'm curious, like, for thinking about that sounds like a whole other thing, like you have the state, you have a corporation, and then whatever this will be is like a whole other way of working. So are there any historical um, comparisons? Yeah, no, I think it's also a very good question. I think the first thing I would say is that these big, big tech companies, you could think of them as a new form of sovereign power as well, right? So I, I want, this is also why I want to tweak the power theories that are mostly thinking about the states, always the Leviathan that we sort of reconceptualizing in different ways. But it's really about power, right? And power can be exerted by different types of agents. And then people very often say, well, the state delegates power to corporations, so we can take that back, and the state has it. I think we really have to fundamentally rethink how we constitute and also control power, um, and that power relations emerge in, in different ways. And I think these are new kind of, you know, very unaccountable, very powerful agents that have to be con controlled, or this, this, the resource that they control has to be governed in a fundamentally different way. Other historical examples, well, I think, you know, it's only. 400 years that we've had nation states, right? We had much more complicated overlapping social systems, um, much more primitive information technology. So I don't think we can easily find a historical example that it gives us guidance here. But what we can understand, I think already, and we know this in real life already, that there are, multi that there are multiple levels of governance regimes that overlap and interact in one way or another. Just think of the European Union. Messy, complex, slow, frustrating, but still, you know, 20 some member states are somehow coming to terms on certain types of decisions and then they're being transposed at the local level into something else. And, and, I, and, you, know, and you can think about also different forms, forms of firm governance, right? That we can have large corporations where only sort of you have shareholders that elect the board and the bo board makes most of the decision or the management does. You can also have more direct participation by different stakeholders in, in firms. So I think the range of possibilities is pretty large. It's not everything new. But I think the, the point is that this is the form of power that has to be controlled with different mechanisms than what we have taken for granted within this idea of hierarchical nation states that we try to make accountable to an electorate. Uh, thank you so much, Christine, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I have a question about blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. You didn't really even mention it. Uh, but it seems like this is a technological solution yes. which already exists for the decentralized decision making. Yes. So have you looked into it? Have you researched yes. it? Uh, because I didn't hear much about yes. it. I didn't go into this. I think on the one slides where we thought about sort of new type of technologies, there were encrypted technologies built into that and blockchain could be used for some of this. You make commitments that are relatively immutable, nothing is completely immutable, you make them in a very decentralized fashion. I think one of the issues with blockchain, especially as applied to Bitcoin or so, is the enormous computational power that you require to do this in a decentralized fashion. So I think we need more innovation there because we can't make all these decisions in, in such an energy heavy um, uh, way. Quantum but in hmm? quantum computers, but they will also need a level of, of energy. But yes, if we can find technological solutions to do this, then this is one of the paths that we definitely are pursuing here. Yeah. Thank you, Katerina. Um, um, I love the artwork, by the way. I, I hope we can see it uh, for real. I have a, a one quick observation and then a question. The observation is I was struck in your description about data and the, the, the enclosure of data, how similar it is to the way in which John um, Locke describes property in chapter 406, I can't remember, of, of the second treatise on government, 
um, and how the, the challenges and the, the way in which he tries to justify the appropriation of, of land and the exploitation and the extractive. And so there's really a, a sort of similarity there. And ultimately, it's the, 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 the way in which white men from Europe invest their labor in the land, and that's what justifies them appropriating it from, from everybody else. So I think there's a really interesting similarity there, which doesn't bode well um, for, for, for the future. And so I was nonetheless struck by the kind of the, the optimism, and you mentioned utopianism, and, 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 and I'm glad to hear it, but tokenism seemed to have a role in that. And um, I don't know that I understand it fully, um, but given that we have artwork here, and we're talking about tokenism, and somehow it, it seems to be connected to private property. Mm -hmm. So how is it a solution? Yeah, it's a, that's, it's, it's a, it's a really good um, question. So I think it's absolutely right that we see parallels between the first enclosure, the second enclosure, and this is the third. So the first was the enclosure of land, the second was the enclosure, enclosure of knowledge, right? This is patent law and trademark law and copyright law. And interestingly, it's also something I should have mentioned is that so the whether or not software code could be protected as intellectual property was always a, a big debate. And I think that also created sort of this gray space for the open source folks to have more, more sway than they might otherwise have had. Um, and then the third one is really the enclosure um, of data. I think that what is interesting about data is it really doesn't have the feature of land. Right, that can really be enclosed. It's more like knowledge, which is also non-rivalrous. Right? We should all be able to share our knowledge with anybody, anybody trying to, to um, um, enclose it. But you can only create surplus value that you can extract if you enclose. And the same is true for data. And so we, for data, we use a combination of technological enclosure and, and trying to impose rights, property rights. Also, trade secrecy law is, plays an important role. So, um, so why then could property rights be an answer to something where property rights is really the problem is the question that you that you ask. And I think it's not only, we're not only arguing for individual property rights, but yes, vesting control rights with those who are producing the data. So there's a Lockean element in it, right? So who's producing this value that should give you it the justification, the moral justification to say there should be a right here. But at the same time, also realizing this is always a collective process because your data alone of no value to you and also not to anybody else. What is of value to anybody is sort of the aggregate level of data, what they tell you about persons that are like other persons and, 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 and patterns of behavior rather than just completely individualized behavior. But in order to create viable mechanisms of control, we believe, and maybe we can be, be persuaded otherwise, that you need to have collective decision making that bringing those people who have the ultimate control rights together and create governance structures for them to make collectively the decision. So rather than thinking about property where somebody has property and the other one does not, you have the new owner, the landlord that pushes the commoners or the indigenous people off the land, you're saying actually you all have property rights. Right? And what you have to make sure is that you have decision-making processes, governance processes that realize each and everyone's control rights, but in a way that's collectively meaningful. And that's sort of the ultimately, ultimate gov governance conundrum. Yeah. But I don't think the solution can be necessary to say there's going to be some state agency or some other centralized actor that does it for everybody else. Right? So it, we have to find, find ways to combine the individual rights holders with an effective collective decision-making mechanism. Thank you. So uh, my question follows up quite a bit on what you just mentioned, Professor. So um, it will be on the legal side of things. What would be the next step, ideally, on the legal side? So you've mentioned that um, the basis of the current data protection laws on privacy is not quite robust enough. So um, as a procedure, should we base ourselves on those existing protections and then level them up, waiting for these great solutions on the technological side of things? Or should we break away completely from associating data with privacy due to its uh, fragile state? You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't break away from what we have already achieved because it's, it's, very, it's much harder to build new things than to destroy them. And there will be a lot of stakeholders who would like to have the current structures destroyed. I think in Europe, many people feel a little safer um, about their data than you would in the United States because there is this protection um, 
against private power more so than there is in the United States. I'm not sure whether we fare much better in Europe in terms of state surveillance than we do in the United States, sort of a separate, that's a, that's, um, that, that's a separate issue. But I would build new systems in parallel to that. And I think um, you know, one thing that has to go is that we associate individualized control only with something that is of economic value to the controller. That's basically the US line of case law that says you can't have property because it's of no value to you. That's something that would have to go. Right? So that realizing the control rights of those who produce that information, because only then can you also create structures for collective decision making amongst others. And, and I would do this in parallel. Thank you, Katharina. That was incredible. Um, I'm wondering how much or to what extent you're thinking about sort of like the, cult the global cultural implications of this. I guess I'm asking that um, from a place of like, you know, you have Silicon Valley's utopic vision of what tech can be, and then you go to other places like, you know, where I'm from, the Philippines, where that reality plays out in a very dystopic fashion. And then by the time that like, you know, like democracy is messed up, like there's no real accountability and when, when that's being tried, like the, like these issues are just so complicated and the technology is actually very hard to wrap your head around that by the time it gets into policy, people aren't even really asking the right questions because they don't really understand, you know, what, what the aggregate data means or all of these things. So I'm wondering like where or if, if you have been thinking about how that plays out because it's the World Wide Web and in theory it needs to be inclusive and not just like Silicon Valley based um, and I'm right. wondering what where yeah. you are with that. Well I think this is again where, where, where our ideas about um, uh, new, new form of democratic decision making come in so the kind of liquid or open democracy which is bottom up rather than top down. So I think the World Wide Web, I think it comes across in the way it's being represented as a, a very sort of monolithic um, uniform, also the way that, you know, the kind of aesthetics that we're producing with that, that is very much sort of West Silicon Valley kind of style. Doesn't have to be that way, but it's becoming increasingly controlled by sort of the big powerhouses in, in, in big tech. Our idea is basically to say it's got to be local. Local decentralized but inter interoperable <coughs> so that you can communicate with others across these different networks, but the networks would be built um, bottom up. And I think also the way in which you would make decisions would vary. Um, if you think, you know, I do a lot of comparative law as well and, and, and law and development, and I think the same mechanisms never work as effectively in one place like in, in another one. And mostly you can see, um, uh, and I've done sort of even empirical research on that, on, on the transplantation of legal institutions. They never work in different contexts the way they work in the first. Um, and so you have to think about how to f develop mechanisms. If you want the outcome that simulate, but maybe you want different outcomes um, from, from the bottom up. In a way, I think what, what attracts me to this digital technology is that it gives you a lot more flexibility if you can harness it in the right way doesn't have to be you know, that expensive, doesn't have to be licensed, that you don't have access to it. It could be open source, much of these things is open source, it could be more open source de facto and getting more people to participate, which requires of course some toad coding knowledge, um, but I think it could also be um, a, a much more colorful um, uh, world if we, if we succeeded. That's, I think that was again sort of this utopian idea of Ted Nelson. Right, we have sort of this, we're creating this, this world where everybody can come in and build their own idea of a web and, 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 and bring that also to others. And that has never been realized. I think that's also a utopia at some level. I think we have to be realists about power relations, also about technological feasi feasibility and costs. Um, uh, ultimately, we have to fund the, even the development of these um, projects, so there will be compromises made. But I think the idea of bringing this down to the local and making it decentralized rather than centralized is part of the answer to your, to your question. Not the full, I realize. <laughs> Thanks, Katerina. This is just a <coughs> fascinating talk. Um, I had one thing which is somewhat inchoate, but back to your early thing about defining power. Could one say that part of the operation of coded power is to get people to believe in its own self-representation as a totalizing form of power? 
So I totally see your idea of the um, of where you want to go, of different alternative um, decentered forms. But what on the other side already it's very vulnerable in terms of the rise of BitTorrents, in terms of the rise of all sorts of piracy, the attempt to capture data also produce the techniques to then de liberate that data, in terms of the rise of criminal networks that then capture their own and then lock people's data and then there's a lot of unintended consequences in what big capital is doing, what big tech is doing. There are a lot of forces at work in the world that run counter to it in good, potentially, <laughs> and certainly bad ways. So that is, is the sort of a code of power itself more vulnerable than its own self-representation? I think it's certainly vulnerable. I think the question is, is it more vulnerable if we um, decentralize it more or if we centralize it, right? So I think the abuse can come from different directions. Um, I think my my hunch, my tu intuition is that um, uh, uh, that there is more. There will different there will be different types of abuses, but I think I'm more concerned with the centralized controls of the streamlining than with a more messy world of decentralized control. Even though it will also involve a lot of <laughs> abuse, um, but you know that's probably difficult to predict. I'm not sure I would be able to predict this. I think what we what we can learn a little bit from you know the more the analog code, which is the the legal coding, right? I think um, a lot of power has been um, uh, built also by trying to control a decentral, more decentralized um, institutions like the institutions of private law. A lot of power has been built also on the transnational level, but always because we have certain mechanisms that link it back to centralized power. That's that's I think has been a very powerful mechanism. And so, um, you know, I, I can't you know I can't rule this out. Of course not. I mean, there will be a lot of messy and a lot of ab abuse. At the same time, I think um, if we um, yeah, my hunch, this is really more than a hunch, is that sort of the vesting decentralized agents with uh, decision making, not for only for their own, but also in collective and community, they might be able to find well, ways to protect themselves. But I'm not sure what the, alter the alternative is really sort of these, these the, what we have, right? And, 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 and worse to come. And I think it's worth um, an, another attempt to, to decenter. Overall, I think what we've seen, you know, again, this is sort of the me meta level. What we see very often is that you, um, you challenge existing power structures, um, and, um, and then the disruptors become the new power wielders, right? That's typically what we see, those levels of centralization and decentralizing and recentralization. The question is, can we leave, leave it at a level that is organized, not complete anarchy, right? That sort of organized, well, organized crime is also organized, <laughs> as the word says. Um, but can we leave it at a certain level where we can make collective decisions without moving back into this, into the, the power grab by centralized agents? Uh, thanks a lot for, for the talk. Uh, this is also an, a difficult exercise <coughs> of foresight, uh, um, but uh, what role do you see artificial intelligence uh, play into this big picture? Well, this is, I mean, the way that our data is currently being used, the kind of information that we either use or don't use in trying to train machines is part of that picture, right? So who makes a decision about what kind of information goes into um, the machine learning that then sort of produces what we call artificial intelligence, which is actually nothing else but using a certain set of data, training machines that they recognize certain patterns and then using them in the future. You know, we have a very sort of, you know, fancy, fancy word in, in artif artificial intelligence as if it was something completely different. It's building in biases and structures that we have today, amplifies them because we use computational power to make that legible and applicable and binding on a much larger scale. Um, and so here again, I think I, I would be more for a messy pluralist <laughs> kind of experimentation, which is of course probably already beyond our control. We know that China has the uh, heads up in, in the development of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, 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 and, and, and the argument seems to be that certainly what Facebook and other companies are saying, that unless we get 
the ability to do the same, we won't be able to compete with China, and it's going to be even worse. But it's going to be another centralized actor that will use the computational power that you need for creating powerful artificial intelligence in a certain way. And I think it's, again, this is going back to Benninger, it's, it's the idea, it's not only computational power, but also selecting what goes into that, the kind of information that does not go, and the kind of information that, that will be um, amplified. And um, you know, here again, trying to vest power with more at a more decentralized level, saying what kind of information, the data that we produce shall go into something like that, and how it's going to be used would be beneficial if feasible. Uh, that, a very interesting talk, and I, I was delighted to hear some of your points of view and, uh, uh, and, and points that you made. Uh, the recent question of uh, touching on a, uh, what I think is almost a more important subject is what is done with the data. And uh, it's not just data protection. To some extent, privacy, I think, has been a bit of a red herring, which has probably suited Google and the rest of them uh, for a long time. And I wonder whether you had any ideas, apart from decentralization, which obviously is one, but it is, it's much more what people do with the data. And given that we are, <coughs> without sounding too paranoid, trapped in an internet world with dealings with banks and things like that, can you see any sort of controls being brought in in that field? Well, I think, I think the fundamental question for me is whether we believe that we can do these controls by empowering, let's say, state agents, legislatures, or international agreements to control certain aspects of this. And I think that will be um, always only just a little bit of breathing space until they have figured out how to get around this. So I think, that, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to decentralized control because I think if we were able to make decisions about what kind of information anybody, including banks, could use for any other purpose. So I think it's the, the capacity to store enormous amount of information, calling those informations or these data their own, and then charging others to be able to use the data to, for whatever purposes they want. That's the model that we currently have. But I think it's based on the enormous um, uh, uh, storage of, inf of information. And I think um, that's where I would try to have a counter movement saying you, you just cannot store it. We're not wild animals. Right? <laughs> so we have to take that back and, and be able to channel the kind of information or data that is being used in different directions and, and for different purposes. So the fundamental assumptions that this is up for grabs that can be taken and once I have it, it's mine, that has to be fundamentally altered, I think. And then we can start thinking about how to do this both technologically and, and, and legally. Thank you.